Um, when the Eckharts first came to Winnipeg, um, I knew who they were, and uh, but at the time I was a music critic for the Winnipeg Free Press, and I was very holy. I didn't think that it was suitable for a critic to know the people he criticized. I thought it was prejudicial, mm -hmm. and uh, I never went to parties. I never went to um, to uh, uh, soirees of any kind or invi invited occasions. I steered clear of the community because I believed in George Bernard Shaw's maxim that the critic's hand is against every man's and every man's against his. In other words, it was that to be a critic, you were the person who had the courage to say anything you thought needed to be said, and then you had to be able to defend it, but you didn't pr pretend right. to be or try to be the friend of um, the pe your constituency, the people you criticized. Um, so it, I didn't get to know the Eckharts when they first came. I, I, as I say, I steered clear. Now, Sonia, as you know, was a formidable person. Um, she was intensely passionate, she was high, high energy, she was at the same time extremely intelligent. You got a big brain, a big passion, a big ambition, all going in this tiny person. And uh, she, she was daunting. She was. People used to duck when Sonia came into view because they knew that they were in for it. And she was fearless. And she, she was, was very tiny, though. And she was, but she and she was tactless. She <laughs> didn't care what she said or whose feelings she hurt. She was connected with this marvelous man, Doctor Ferdinand, who was a diplomat, who was highly sophisticated in social matters. So, yeah. Uh, he was as ambitious as she was, but he felt that there was another way of doing this. You didn't have to bombard people. You could, you could get round them. Right. He, he had a whole different approach. So what he did, she'd fire the cannons, and he'd come in and do the diplomacy. However, this was easier to see before I knew them than after. Um, he was, um, after I stopped being a critic, and I did, that was when I really got to know the Eckharts. And, Can you give me some years? Oh, I wish I could. I left, I left the uh, the uh, left Win Winnipeg Free Press in 1966 to become the critic of the Toronto Telegram. But I was still a critic. Mm -hmm. I was there until about 1970, 71. In Winnipeg? No, no, in, oh. uh, in Toronto. I was uh, in Winnipeg till 1966. Okay. I came to Toronto in, in that year, and I was a critic in Toronto until about 1971. And then I became the executive director of the Ontario Federation of Symphony Orchestras. Mm. And, um, and shortly after that, I took on also the Encyclopedia of Music in Canada as the English language editor. Uh, and then I gave up the the orchestras because I've, I found the encyclopedia would be a full-time job and I, mm -hmm. I uh, gave my entire uh, concentration to that. Well, I was nevertheless in Winnipeg from time to time after that and by then I was able to respond. If, if I was invited to the Eckharts, I could go, you know, and I could, and I could have one of those wonderful lunches with the Eckharts, where you'd get fried bananas and all sorts of wonderful exotic things yes. <laughs> that they did so charmingly and so so well. And I became extremely fond of them. Um, Sonia in Winnipeg, and Ferdinand for that matter, were very, very exotic. We had nothing like them in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. It was a very conservative, very... A kind of a, the dynamic was between the the Selkirk settler Anglo's and the Mennonites who had risen to a lot of prominence in musical circles. But these were very conservative people, both of them, and they were not used to to high-powered 
uh, ambitious Europeans were of great sophistication. We, we, we didn't have that. We, our musical tastes tended to be uh, either conventional, classical, mm -hmm. or uh, modern, what they used to call modern English. It's not modern anymore, but you know, Vaughan Williams and, and, um, mm -hmm. and Elgar, and uh, sort of English composers of that era, who were by now rather conservative, but were very accepted as part of the, the established musical taste. Um, but the European avant-garde was really nowhere in Winnipeg. And Sonia came as a kind of representative of that, although she was a member of the of a former avant-garde. That I mean, also she was she was um, post Schoenberg in a way, but she was softer than Schoenberg, not as tough as Schoenberg. But um, it was not what you'd call awfully difficult music. It certainly wasn't for me. I never had any real difficulty with Sonia's music. But it was very unexpected in the Winnipeg scene, as was her character. Mm -hmm. This whole, I mean, we're just not, we, in Winnipeg we were not used to people doing battle. And here we had a woman writing music. That in itself was a shock. Mm -hmm. um, although we'd had Barbara Pentland, but Barbara Pentland had moved away, and Barbara Pentland had always been um, kind of unaccepted by Canadians. They found her too, too austere, too tough. And Sonia came along to Winnipeg and, and filled those, that same kind of shoe, but, but um, she did it with the difference that she wasn't a Canadian. Mm -hmm. She had an accent. She had uh, very European sophistications, and she had this extremely combative manner. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had come from a, an older society in which women also were not accepted. I, I, you don't easily become a woman composer in Germany. No. No. Not easily, or a woman orchestra player, or a woman anything to do with music. Mm -hmm. So she had come from a, a society in which she had had to do battle for every single inch that she had gained. And she, she was, was used to that. She was used to that. For different reasons. For like different it. reasons. But I saw at once that the thing that people found so offensive in Sonia, because it offended their sense of, 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 of being invisible, you know, you, you, don't, you don't display your feelings. You don't, you don't push your way around. You don't do that in Canada. Oh dear, no, no, my, 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 my. And I always think of a little story that Sonia told me the first time I interviewed her. She had come to Canada. She had just arrived as the exotic composer wife of the head of the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And uh, she had a phone call from a woman in the women's committee of the art gallery. Madame Eckhart, I wonder if you'd be kind enough at the next meeting of the women's auxiliary, if you'd be kind enough to bake us some cookies. There was a long pause and said, cookies? Sonia said, cookies? I do not bake the cookies, I bake the notes. I am composing. <laughs> oh, said the woman. Well then, perhaps, perhaps you'd be, perhaps you would pour the tea for the first hour. Power the tea. I do not power the tea. I power the notes. I am composer. Said. So, I mean, she was running right, o right away into the fact that she wasn't a conventional Winnipeg matron, and they were going to hold it against her in uh -huh. some funny way because she wasn't conforming. And uh, it wasn't sort of suitable for, for a, an independent artist, a creative artist, to be a woman or for a woman to be that. It wasn't part of the fabric. So right away she had this to fight. Of course, there was always a kind of inte intellectual nucleus, people of the university, who, who saw that and understood it and were not offended by it and who, who formed a little circle around the Eckharts. People like the Noonans at the university, uh, Nancy and, and uh, uh, forgotten Philip. Mr. Noonan's name. 
uh, but he was uh, he was a mathematics professor at the university, and Mrs. Featherston Haw and Peggy Sampson and people people like that who were themselves sophisticated and had some sense of European cultural culture as well as North American culture and. And they accepted her almost at once and became close friends. But it was a small nucleus. Lauren Watson in Brandon, who was very important for, uh, for the Eckharts. Um, and Lauren, of course, saw that uh, Sonia, as a, as a performing artist, was extremely interesting. She had only the vestiges of a technique. When she, by then, she wasn't playing anymore. She was composing. Mm -hmm. But she could still astonish you at the piano. She could sit down and play anything. And she, could, she played it with a, a, an astounding fluency. And uh, Lauren saw at once that this was a special technique that she had that was, of course, closely closely connected with thinking and with a with kind of rational approach to the hand at the keyboard, but he saw also that it was unusual and revolutionary. It wasn't conventional. So he tried to help her systematize that and, and, and form a, a, a treatise on the technique that she used, which was astounding. And she had some piano pupils, and she... Um, but she could also do the same thing on the violin. She could pick it up and play it, even mm -hmm. though she didn't anymore. Mm -hmm. I remember a lecture she gave on the Chopin etudes, and uh, they're not easy to play. But she illustrated them with her own playing, and it was astounding. And the interesting thing was that everything she did was based on the structure of the music. She thought about the music as a composer composing it, as well as the pianist playing it. And her thoughts were, uh, were wonderful and refreshing. Anyway, I gradually became aware of, of these marvelous people. Uh, and yet during the time that you lived in Winnipeg, you didn't, you, you maintained I, that, that I maintained a, a definite distance. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Sonia was funny, you know, I'd, I'd review a concert mm -hmm. uh, that had a work of hers, and I always thought I quite liked them, but She'd pick up on some little thing that she wouldn't like. I did sometimes accuse her of being discursive. You know, she, she sort of throws down an idea, and instead of developing it, she gets onto another idea, and she seems always to be changing her mind in her music as it goes along. Yeah. So I, uh, I teased her about that in print, and I would get letters, and they were marvelous. I, I must still have some of them someplace. I should try to find them. Uh, written in a very large, bold, rather hard to read hand, um, full of passion and ideas and little musical illustrations that she'd write down. And uh, I loved it. I mean, I thought, good for her. But uh, she wasn't taking criticism lying down, ever. But to me, she was like nobody else that we had. She was an absolutely unique force, musical intelligence. Um, creative entity. Person. She was an amazing person. Uh, Do you, with would, uh, in retrospect, would you respect her more as a, as a person or as a composer? I don't think I could separate them. Okay. I, found, I found that she was all of a piece. She was who she was. One thing about her music, whether you like it or you don't, it was her on the... It was her. It was mm -hmm. herself. Uh, everything she... Everything she did, she meant. And everything she meant came right out of her of her her own life in a funny way. She used to talk about having to get waking up and having to get an idea down on, and she had to have materials right by her bedside. She'd have to get them down while they were fresh. I felt that she she lived her her art. She she and. One of the things that she adored Eckhart for, she said, it is so wonderful 
being married to that man who gives me the quiet I need for my work. And you know, Ferdinand always did that. He, uh, he appreciated what she was and who she was and what she needed, and he, he la never ceased to labor to provide that. That was in spite of his own work, which was, I mean, significant and major and time-consuming. But he nevertheless felt it was his responsibility to create an environment in which Sonia could function. And he did. And she and she never s ceased appreciating that. One of the one of the most touching memories I have. Sonia had come to Ontario to attend a meeting of the um, the Canadian Composers League, whatever they call it. Uh, Canadian League of Composers. Canadian, I think that, yeah. Canadian League of Composers. Yeah. And. Uh, she took Ferdinand with her because her language at that time was um, hit and miss. It was passionate, but it was not necessarily tidy, and she felt a little bit insecure in English, and she wasn't sure she would understand everything. Anyway, she took Ferdinand with her because she thought his, his, his English was smoother and, and that he would get what she didn't get and so forth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they wouldn't let her in to the meeting. They said she could come, but Ferdinand could <laughs> She was crestfallen and heartbroken. And I don't think she went to the meeting. But she felt it. She felt it as a, as an absolute rejection, as a personal. She took it intensely personally by the composers of of Ontario, because it was mostly Ontario. She came to Ontario for the meeting. And uh, it is true that there were many people in the musical establishment who, as I say, ducked when they saw Sonia coming. They 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 were afraid of her and. They mistrusted her, and uh, they were offended by her, by her aggression, and by her her difference. Uh, people are, I mean, even big people can be very small sometimes about these things. Uh, do you think um, that? Uh, how much of that do you think was because of her personality, which, you know, obviously was distinct? Uh, and how much do you think was sort of exacerbated by the fact that she was a woman? Like, could she have gotten away with her personal style um, to a greater degree, you know, um, had, had she been a, a male? Do you think? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe. Um, we've, had, we've had some pretty interesting and good woman composers in Canada. Mm -hmm. As, as I'm sure you know, I mean, mm -hmm. Jean Coulthard, um, 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 well, Barbara Pentland, um, mm, the woman in Alberta, wonderful, oh, Violet Archer. Archer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are wonderful, wonderful composers, and they've had, I, I suppose they have had some difficulty, but on the whole, I think that we've been very accepting of them. them. A little less so of somebody like Pentland, because she was so austere. Okay. I mean, she was really a, a Webernian or a Schoenbergian. She was tough, mm -hmm. and she uh, she did music that was really intellectual and visual, more than sensuous and, and oral. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, uh, austere, and mm -hmm. and for that reason, she wasn't easily accepted. But it wasn't because she was woman. No, I don't think. I think that on the whole, uh, women have been. More, more readily embraced in Canada than in many places as composers. And you've got some wonderful young women coming up as composers. I don't know whether you've heard uh, the um, Stabat Mater by Ramona Lungen. It's a marvelous piece. I've, I've heard of her and that piece, but no, it's I haven't heard It's a very it. remarkable piece. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a... It, it learned a lot from Benjamin Britten's War Record. Mm, okay. I mean, it takes the, the Latin stuff at Mater and intersperses right. five English, oh. or fi five poems, one of which is in English. The others are not English. They're, uh, uh, they're French, German, and Russian. Uh, so she, she goes further right. than Benjamin Britten, who just right. had English poems between the Latin. Right. Right. But it's the same idea. It's taking a classic Latin uh, poem of the church and interspersing with a sense of irony and a sense of 
of many things, um, uh, relevant poetry mm -hmm. of a different kind. But it, it makes a big work, it makes an 80 minute work, which is really well worth listening to. Too eclectic for me, to me the, the, the musical style is perhaps not um, unified enough, but it's uh, nevertheless a fascinating piece. That's a young woman. And I don't think I don't think women now have have difficulties. I'm sure that that Jean Coulthard encountered difficulties. I'm sure that Violet Archer encountered many difficulties. I'm sure that uh, Barbara Pentland did as younger composers. Mm -hmm. Now Sonia came full fledged and was dropped right down in the middle of a conservative Canadian prairie town and. Uh, the ripples widened forever. I mean, it was a big splash. Yeah. And uh, I can still see her. You know, it was. she was just like a little atom of energy. And she just flew around. And, her, and if she got angry, boy, you knew. <laughs> but I, uh, I just came to, to think she was marvelous. Marvelous. I was so, it was such a shot in the arm for women. And I think that I think that people like Peggy Sampson, I think, knew exactly what she was and who she was and how important she was. Um, but you know, we'll never replace her. How, how do you replace such a person? They're unique. So your your um, um, sort of more personal relationship with with both Sonia and Ferdinand. Um, started developing more so after you left, after, I, after you left after, Winnipeg. After actually. I really after I left Winnipeg. So you left in '66, mm -hmm. and then you would come back for I came back this for that. this and that, yeah. and, and they and, were very and then, often. Or when they were in Toronto, they would mm -hmm. they would contact you and that. Yeah. So you must have been on good terms with them. However, like in the end, I was on very good yeah. terms. Yeah. I think that I mean, uh, Ferdinand at one point sent me the most lovely uh, original hand print of, of one of the Gramate mm -hmm. portraits of Sonia, which I have and I have it, you know, I have it in my study and, and uh, I'm very glad to have it. I, it's uh, very important to me and very personal. Um, and he, al they also, he also sent me some, some sort of machine prints, you know, good mm -hmm. prints of Gramate paintings. Like reproductions. Reproductions. Yeah. But but this one, of course, is very. Uh, it's, a, it's an a, original. An original graphic, uh, Gramate graphic uh, in uh, is it three colors? But it's it's very nice and uh, it's very speaking likeness of a younger Sonia, and I'm awfully glad to have it. But uh, and that was just out of the blue because I don't know maybe some maybe I'd done some broadcasts or something about her or uh, I forgot. But uh, he sent a very nice little note saying that he felt that I was a true friend, and, uh, and uh, I was. I mean, I, I still am. I still honor them very much and think so well of them. And as I say, I feel kind of mean that I was not able to respond when he, he uh, came to see me to ask if I would be involved in a, a committee of some kind uh, for the promotion and preservation of Sonia's music. Uh, I entirely approve of the idea, and I think it's marvelous. I mean, he, he showed me one time the Egon Schiele uh, uh, ink drawings and, and water paintings that he had. And uh, they were just stunning. I, I've always been interested in the visual arts, as it really almost as interested as in music. And uh, I'd never seen anything like them. I thought they were fabulous. Well, then, those are the things that he turned into money, right. selling them advantageously late in his life. And uh, with that money, he, he set up a future for Sonia. He went right after it and did it. I mean, he, uh, the foundation and all the, all the things that he did, um, things like getting all the sonatas, the piano sonatas recorded by Marc-Andre Amelin, and uh, a number of recordings of her music, and all, all these things that he, he did so astutely. He was a very, he knew perfectly well that, uh, that it was necessary to do these things, that you couldn't 
just expect them to happen. Um, he felt that you had to help fate a little bit, and he did. He set, set about it. He did it systematically, and he did it very intelligently. The, um, the competition in Brandon is so important. Mm -hmm. It's been so important for young Canadian musicians, and it carries her name. And uh, he was very wise, very wily. Um, I didn't see him for the last few years of his life. Uh, I was very sorry I couldn't go. There was a, a big celebration. Was it his 90th birthday in Winnipeg? Mm -hmm. That would have been in um, in 92. That's it. That was it. I would like very much to go, but I could, A, I couldn't afford to. I mean, it's, a, it's terribly expensive traveling back and forth in your own country these days. And uh, and it, it came at a time that was very difficult for me, so I couldn't. And uh, But I, I feel I didn't really see him after that very much, and I felt bad about it. Um, I don't know what he was like as an as a old, old man. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I had some contact with the people in the foundation, but... Uh, mm -hmm. You've probably uh, spoken with Paul von Wickert over the years? Yes. He was the, the music advisor yes. for about seven or eight years. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Uh, is he still connected with Paul? Uh, yeah. I mean, I replaced him. Uh, oh, because, I see. Because he resigned uh, yes. uh, in 97. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, almost exactly two years ago, mm -hmm. and um, and then he uh, he took a position on the board, you know, uh, just to, to, uh, uh, as an. You know, Is he still living in Winnipeg? Mm -hmm. Yeah, although he he's encountered some health problems more recently, so he um, has a little, he's he's on a leave of absence currently, uh, but but he's still very much mm -hmm. um, uh, sympathetic to the cause, mm -hmm. and I believe that he hopes. I liked him very much. To, uh, to continue again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. We actually, uh, yesterday was um, the big celebration for Sonia's 100th birthday at the uh, at the foundation. Did you receive the invitation? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought I had hoped. Was so, very, yeah. Very so that, nice. that we had. And, uh, I'm going, was, I've got another 100th anniversary to go to. My mother's 100th birthday is in August. And I have to go to that, so yes. that's my budget for the year. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just really nice to uh, to meet some. Uh, there was uh, a lot of her former students, you know, so, uh, many of who had just been names to me, like mm -hmm. you know, or were mentioned. In was the Deidre there? Deidre no, Harris? although Deidre Harris is doing a, a, a Lauren Watson has set up a Canadian tour for her um, in the fall. She's coming, mm. and uh, I believe I don't know if she's performing in Toronto, but I think she's doing a concert with Kitchener. Mm. Um, as far as I know, um, and then um, I hope I can West. hear her. I haven't heard yeah. her play for years. Yeah, we'll have to make a point of uh, once the dates are sort of uh, finalized of letting you know. But that, in fact, Lauren Watson played uh, her Nocturne at the uh, at this little reception yesterday. Oh, and he's he's uh, almost eighty, I think. And oh never, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I mean, he it, it was it was, was it okay? beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good for still, him. Yeah, he's still very. I mean, he's still active, adjudicating for the conservatory for and doing a lot of things. Very high regard for him. Yeah. In 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 a sort of quiet way, but persistent way, he did a huge amount for music in Manitoba, and he, to me, the uh, Brandon Music School has always been more interesting than the Winnipeg one, and that's because of him mm -hmm. and Peggy Sharp. He and Peggy Sharp between them. Right. Yeah. And uh, what's his name? Is he still there? Um, Jones, Lawrence Jones. Is he still in Brandon? Yes, he is. Yeah. And in fact, um, in he fact, I, I uh, was at the competition in the first weekend of May, and uh, and I spoke with him quite a bit. He didn't happen to be able to make it to this reception yesterday. Mm. But yeah, he's retired, <clears throat> but is a uh, Lawrence Jones is retired mm -hmm. from the music department, but I think he has an emeritus kind of... Because he's about my age, standing. so he would be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think he you know, still does a bit of teaching. Like He still has a phone number mm -hmm. at the university, but he is mm -hmm. he's officially retired. Who's running it now? The music department? Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Carruthers, actually, is the new dean. Mm -hmm. um, just was appointed last summer. Oh. And uh, he actually did his, uh, his master's thesis at Carleton, uh, I think in, uh, not in the music department, but in Canadian studies, I believe he did oh. a master's degree. And he, his was the first thesis on Sonia's music. 
In oh, fact, really? Yeah, he, he did a, like a full thesis that kind of um, looks at all her, you know, uh, mentions all of her music and in a, in a biographical kind of framework and then takes certain pieces, th you know, over the course of her life and goes into a more detailed theoretical analysis. Is it published? I mean, is um, it available? Yeah, oh, I believe so. I mean, we have a copy. I'd love to have a copy. Oh, okay. I'd be very that. interested. Yeah, oh, it's very interesting to read. And it was the first, you know, it was, it was prior to, um, it was prior to Music From Within, I think, you know, I mean, so it was the first, um, and Music From Within, yeah, uh, it doesn't deal with her music. Not really, no, not really. No, not, not in this It's very much way. more I mean, the person. Yeah, and Glenn Carothers is a, is a composer as well. I mean, so, you know, he, he deals with the music, you know, uh, on that, on that level. Um, it's very, very interesting. Mm, I'd, I'd love to have yeah. it because yeah. I'd, I'm, I'm, I'm much encouraged to know that whoever is running the Brandon Music School has that kind of connection with her. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in fact, at this at this um, competition, uh, because it is the 100th anniversary this year, they, uh, Lawrence Jones had kind of organized a, uh, a small colloquium or, or symposium mm -hmm. um, it, entitled... Uh, you know, the centennial anniversary, you know, a critical look, you know, at, at Sonia's contribution mm -hmm. um, to, to music in, in Canada, that kind of thing. And, and Glenn Crothers um, gave a sort of an, uh, chaired the panel and gave, you know, a, a, probably a 15 minute kind of introductory mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, chat. And then Linda Schwartz is a, a professor um, in, in Winnipeg. And she's. Um, published several articles on Sonia and is actually contributing a major article um, to the anthology of women composers mm -hmm. that Macmillan mm -hmm. is putting out. It's a 12 volume oh. anthology and they're they're um, going by by era mm -hmm. and then also by genre. So I you know I think you know for 17th century uh, there'll be like orchestral vocal keyboard or mm -hmm. and then 18th century same 19th mm -hmm. and 20th that sort mm -hmm. of thing so um, she's contributing um, an article on Sonia's violin concerto oh not the solo but the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the orchestral mm -hmm. concerto mm -hmm. um, and uh, to, to that so she's done a, a lot of writing about Sonia and so she also gave uh, gave a, a talk and then there's a uh, a PhD student in theory at Indiana University right now who's doing, uh, who's just finishing up her dissertation on um, on Sonia, and and they brought her in. She's she's been at the foundation um, doing some research about two years ago, um, you know, looking at primary sources, and so the foundation was aware of her and suggested that they might be interested in uh, in bringing her as a, as a guest. So she sort of gave the the sort of keynote address. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there was some discussion. Yeah, it was it was very. I mean, it, you know, it was very small in that in that um, the, the competition isn't widely attended. Mm -hmm. Period um, by by the general public. Mm -hmm. And and then this was just uh, you know on the Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So it was fairly uh, fairly tiny, but uh, but it was it was very significant. And to have none of these presenters uh, had met each other. I mean, they all knew of each other, but had never actually met personally. And uh, so I think that was. That was also very significant, you know, because we've got people who are still academically active mm -hmm. and um, and doing work, you know, on Sonia's music. Uh, so how big how big is the foundation itself now? What I mean, what what does the foundation consist of at this point? Um, well, the, there's there's a board of trustees, mm -hmm. and then there's um, sort of an executive secretary who um, who kind of runs you know runs the foundation works works half time um, but is in in charge of she happens to be a German speaker um, mm -hmm. and German uh, yeah, is well she's very fluent in German mm -hmm. and so and has spent uh, 10 or 15 years in Germany as well so she she kind of is the connection between the art galleries in Germany that have Gramatis art mm -hmm. um, and that you know that kind of she's the hands-on mm -hmm. uh, liaison mm -hmm. and then she oversees sort of the general kind of running mm -hmm. of the foundation and then there's the music advisor who was formerly Paul mm -hmm. and, and then I've been mm -hmm. in that position for the last two years so I look solely af uh, after promoting and preserving doing archival kinds of kinds of activities mm -hmm. with the music and correspondence and that sort of thing and then also doing a lot of promoting primarily actually promoting 
um, her her music in various ways. And then there's um, sort of um, well, Linda, who's, who's the director, has an assistant, a part-time assistant, and then there's also another woman who's a, a native German speaker who's, who uh, comes in and does a lot of the filing and copying and is actually doing a lot of the archival kind mm -hmm. of database organizing, mm -hmm. like going through all the correspondence and the like, category. I mean, and Sonia and Ferdinand kept everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, like every shard of paper was I'm kept. Sure. So, so this, I mean, that's ongoing, you know, mm -hmm. it will mm -hmm. sort of be an eternal project. So, yeah, so that's the, the staff. So everybody works part-time. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and the foundation is still in the house. Is it? Yeah, Harrow yeah. Street. Yeah, and in fact, that's where this reception, reception was, and a lot... Uh, has the house uh, been kept sort of as they left it? No kidding. Mm -hmm. It was, again, you see, there wasn't a house like that in Winnipeg. No. No. With his black walls and all sorts of yeah, interesting things. Yeah, in the things. basement, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, the basement, I'm sure, doesn't, it, like, it hasn't been renovated in any way. I mean, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 where there's a lot of, where we store a lot of the paperwork mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So, I mean, it doesn't look like we no. hold a cocktail party there any longer. No. But, but, yeah. I it mean, wasn't the sort of Gramate Gallery that it was then. I no. Sure. I no. guess, did they have a lot of his art? Is that oh. where they would have it? Up in the basement? These black walls and all these paintings uh, around, you see. Oh yeah. See, I've been I've been uh, trying to find somebody who's actually who recollects being at parties oh. in, in the basement because a lot of people say, well, no, I just always was at these events in the living room. And, oh and no, that, I remember course, the basement. Well. Oh, okay. And I can't imagine this this basement, which now looks, you know. It was like walking into 1920s Germany. Wow. I mean, it was Describe it was this, really. Um, um, an expressionist experience, you know. You wow. felt you were, you were part of the of the era of, of Granate and Sheila and all those people and Klimt and all that. It was, um, you know, it was very remarkable and, and it's way very beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, Dr. Eckhart had a, a real aesthetic sense. It was of a certain kind, mm -hmm. but although it was very wide ranging too, because he had his glass collection and he had his his uh, various areas of, of, of art and mm -hmm. the history of art that interested him. but uh, Did they serve drinks from that bar in the basement? Like oh, they must have. I, I, like, I certainly remember sort of having away. the wine with the strawberries floating in it and things <laughs> like that, little sliced strawberries. There, there, were, there was always a little wrinkle. <laughs> You know, uh, you'd have a, you'd have a little a little uh, hors d'oeuvre or something, and it would be like no little hors d'oeuvre you'd ever had. The other thing I remember was their I mean their lunches were marvelous and full of interest. But I remember their um, their um, you know, what's the one of those darn things that look like roses or cabbages, and you take off a, off a leaf artichoke. Yeah. They they do the whole artichoke, and uh, they'd make a. a lovely orange mayonnaise to dip your, <laughs> for all these little things. Those and the fried bananas and the little wrapped up pieces of ham with interesting things inside of them. No, 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 it was always a big experience. So you would have you would have um, popped in on your visits to Winnipeg from yep. between about 67 then, or 66, 67? Yes, I think that would be, yes, that would be, it would mid, be after that. the yes. mid 80s, did you visit the house even after Sonia had passed away? Like she, she I don't think I was ever there when she wasn't there. I don't think so. It so would what, be so this within would have a fairly a ten, narrow grade. A ten years sort of span. Yes. Like from 66 to 74. Yeah, sort of. More Eight less. years. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, really. Um, I'm sure that I was at a couple of things while I was still a critic, but I was there in a kind of detached way. You know, I, I wasn't sort of of it. Right. Um, and I was also there, I think, uh, to interview Sonia at the time. I interviewed her for the for the Winnipeg Free Press. I did a, an interview with her. Mm -hmm. And um, but it was always, you know, I always sort of knew my place, as it were. I didn't try to impinge on any sort of personal level. I tried to be as I don't know as detached as I could. Yeah. And. Uh, which I can, I can understand, I mean, in order to maintain yeah. some sort yeah. of objectivity in your very hard. career. Yeah, very hard. Very hard. And very hard for a young man. Now that I'm a, an old man, I can, I can imagine being, uh, being pleasant and affable to a, if I was a critic, 
and uh, and still criticizing in print. But as a young man, you, you sort of felt you you had to not only uh, be uh, impersonal, but you had to seem to be impersonal. You had to be you had to be behind a barrier. You know? mm -hmm. um, do you do you recall your very first meeting with Sonia? Where you where you would have met her? This was a sort I, of a difficult question. It's very difficult yeah. because my sense of chronology is a bit, I'm sure, warped. <laughs> Skewed. But I, I know that I saw her and probably met her when one of her pupils was playing something and she was there as the teacher. It may have been at a music festival. All I know is that um, she was very angry about something. And uh, I don't know what it was. It must have been a festival because I think the adjudicator said something about the pupil that infuriated, it may have been Dietrich, that infuriated her. And uh, she was she was having a temper. And she was flying around like a little bomb. Her hair was going in her, and she was uh, speaking in a, in a very peremptory way, but she was ready to do battle with anybody who came near. And I may have met her on that occasion, I'm not sure. I don't remember, I certainly remember vividly seeing her. She was always very striking in her, uh, she wore these little sort of butcher boy suits. I think, I mean, she regarded herself as Beethoven, you know. I mean, she sort of dressed like Beethoven and had a hairdo like Beethoven, and she had a big head like Beethoven, and she was like a little Beethoven. And she, she, she just sort of moved around in bursts of energy. And she had this, these little uh, white uh, shirts that she wore with a little tie, a little kind of mm -hmm. token tie at the, at, the, at the neck. They were very masculine, and yet the funny thing about it, there was nothing really masculine about Sonia. She was, she was all woman in, a, in many ways. And the thing that... that uh, The thing that sort of revealed this was the pathos. She had a she had a wonderful sense of pathos, and when she was feeling sorry for herself or saw, thought somebody had been mean to her, she would she would in in quite a quiet voice she'd she'd um, plaintive little voice she'd talk about this, you know, and uh, it was the other side to the to the explosive aggressive. Uh, tempestuous side. The other side was very soft, very vulnerable, and almost like a little girl. And she carried, I mean, she was always a prodigy. She was like a prodigy who, in some ways, in some part of her being, never grew up. Brilliant, childlike, um, very uh, quick, uh, quick to, to flame up, quick to be crestfallen, quick, very quick. And always, always that you felt this 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 intense speed in her life. But um, what uh, which, which work of hers stands out the most for you? Well, I like a number of them. I uh, I like certain movements of the piano sonatas very much. I don't like them all through, but I like certain movements extremely well, and I'm, I'm very glad that Amala has recorded them because we've got that. I love the uh, the big symphony concerto that um, that Anton Querty uh, right. recorded. I heard him play that in Winnipeg. It was it was after a performance of that that uh, I was at the Eckhart's at one point for one of their evenings, and. Uh, it was a very hot evening, a very tough evening, because Anton, uh, as you may know, was very much a, a communist in sympathies. 